Welcome to the Upshot, Ulti World podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm your host, Josh Mansfield. Charlie is off for today and tomorrow on vacation, which means I will be holding down the fort. He will be back for our Thursday show in time to preview for the preserve. But in the meantime, I will be having joining me a very special guest. He is the content development manager at the Disc Golf Pro Tour, but you guys probably, mo- and more importantly, know him as a former host here at the Upshot. That's right. Jamie Thomas, back on the Upshot. Jamie, thanks for coming. Hey, Josh. Thanks for having me, man. I'm excited. Absolutely. You know, we were talking about having to make the rounds of all the different host partnerships that we could do. Uh, did you ever do a show with uh, Steve Hill when you were back on the Upshot? Ooh, maybe, maybe not. That might be the one, maybe that's the one that's like fossilized and can't be recreated, but we get to have this pairing, which is super cool. So I'm stoked. That's right. See, I I really think that we just need to one day, Charlie and I just go on vacation and have you and Steve just show up and run the show all by yourself. So we got to hit every combo, right? I think we just got to. So yeah, put some like classic graphics up, you know, like they got ESPN, (laughs) ESPN classic, just these two old guys. Everybody's like, who are they? (laughs) Why are they here? (laughs) No kidding. No, that would be a lot of fun. But Jamie, glad to have you. Uh, We have a really exciting show for you today. We're going to do a little bit of breakdown of the Match Play Championship and talk about the results there. Jamie's then going to give us an update on some of the things going on on the media side over at the Disc Golf Pro Tour. And then finally, I have Danny Voss joining me. He is the Director of Marketing over at the PDGA and we talk a little bit about what's going on with the PDGA. So it's a nice opportunity. You know, Match Play Championships was a fun weekend, but a good opportunity to catch up on some of the important organizations in the sport. So on Match Play Championship, we have Joel Freeman over an MPO beating out Kevin Jones in order to take the title and Owen Scoggins beating out Ella Hansen in the finals. Uh, you know, and Owen, if we want to talk about some incredible performance, Owen didn't lose or tie a single match the entire weekend. So she was 5-0 and in all her matches. And the craziest part was she only dropped two holes for the entire tournament. I just crushed the competition uh, over on the FPO side. Yeah, Owen's incredible. I mean, obviously, we know her as, an, as, as a fantastic putter, leading the league in a couple of these categories and coming off the podium finish at Portland, playing really well at OTB. I mean, she's here just to disrupt the storylines that, you know, there's these, OK, 15, 18, 20 year olds coming into the game. She's like, I don't care. I'm here and I'm doing it. It's so exciting to watch. Well, it was funny during the press conference, which is, in my opinion, the best part of this event. Uh, Rebecca Cox, uh, going up against Owen in in the first match of the group play, said that Owen is pretty good for her age. Uh, (laughs) I I think Owen is pretty good for everyone's age. Uh, I I wish I could play like Owen Scoggins. And, and, you know, after uh, Owen crushes Rebecca Cox, you know, I imagine that a post-round press conference would look a little bit different. Yeah. Also, Owen is just the press conference goat. Let's just be real about this. Like, you know, honorable mention to Missy Gannon for the stunt she likes to pull in the match play pressers. But like week in and week out, if you're not watching Owen Scoggins presser, you're like you're like missing out a little bit on life. I feel like you really are. And and it's so much so much fun to watch Owen play, because like you said, I mean, she's known for her putting, but she also I mean, she throws in such a way that is so compact that even though it doesn't get the you know necessary distance as compared to some of the longest throwers, it still has an explosive sense of power that just makes it so exciting to watch. She throws some incredible flex lines that are very reminiscent in the Nico style uh, with overstable discs in order to gain those extra few feet of distance. And But the amount of control that she demonstrates over it, it, it means that you really have to take away a round from own if you want to, because she's not going to give you anything. It never lets up an inch. Her foot's always on the pedal. And it, it makes an incredible and exciting storyline to watch. Yeah. And, you know, kind of similar to Juliana Corver keeps it really low. So you're not going to see mm-hmm. a lot of wide ranging mistakes out of her because you're not going to have these big left right variances compared to these players who really loft the disc high up in the air. So it, it's really hard to get her to make a, a fatal flaw. Like you're saying, you've really got to take it past her level, one upper in the gear department to, to win. Well, and that's one of the exciting things, I think, of hosting in Bailey, Colorado. I, you know, me being in Idaho, I play in Rocky Mountain Disc Golf all the time. Uh, we have, you know, I've, I've got a mountainous course up in a cross-country ski resort 20 minutes from my house. 
and half of the holes have some sort of an elevation change and the angle, the nose angle is especially sensitive because if you throw slightly nose up or, or do so intentionally with the lofty style distance throws like you were talking about, Jamie, it, it's amazing how fast on a downhill hole your disc can get away from you if you are not matching the angle of that hill properly. And so for Owen, who has the opportunity and the ability to do so, it, it's not shocking to me that she gains an advantage on a course that has significant elevation changes. It, I think it might bode well for her for a tournament like uh, Deglo, that also has a lot of those up and down shots that she has that kind of angle control. And she may be a sneaky favorite to podium over at Deglo. Yeah, we actually did this. I'll shameless plug our show League Night over on Disc Golf Network. Please uh, do. It's a great show. Yeah, thanks, man. We we actually had a segment last week where we did Dark Horse or Favorite uh, to make the podium and Own Scoggins came up and just like now even more so. I'm pretty sure I put her as a favorite. I hope I'm not lying here. But, uh, you know, after this week, like you just have to start thinking of her as a threat and maybe a Dark Horse to win something, maybe a big tournament later this year. Who knows? But like you're saying, just the way she plays the game, she's she's rewriting the storylines this season. Yeah, she she really is. Um, it, it'll be exciting, you know, talking to Danny Voss a little bit later. Talks about there will be coverage available, U.S. Women's, that we'll get some coverage of own uh, if she plays in the FP40 division. So we'll get to make sure to watch her maybe take another uh, major title uh, later this year. Uh, over on MPO, Joel Freeman beats Kevin Jones in what I think, I mean, it's interesting because I think the storyline was and the hype was surrounding different players coming into this event. I know me personally, uh, but Charlie as well, really talking about Gandon Burr, the, the young player, really exciting, obviously having a great season. We were expecting big things from him. He gets beat out by Kevin Jones three to one in the semifinals. And then Joel Freeman on hole differential overcomes Simon Lazat in the group play, which Simon having all the momentum and energy behind him. So it set up what I think was an unlikely final that most people probably didn't have, though I have to give credit to Charlie because Charlie did have Kevin Jones advancing uh, up until, uh, I don't remember if it was finals or if he at least just got him out of the pool play. So shout out to Charlie for, for making that pick, but definitely an unlikely finals in my opinion. Yeah, and, and two contrasting styles as well out of those two guys in the finals. So you got to give Joel a little bit of the, uh, you know, home, home state advantage. there. definitely playing out of Colorado. Like you're saying, you know, Idaho Freeman knows Colorado. Just, it's a Absolutely. little bit different, especially up in Bailey. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny that if you want to talk about great pressers, uh, big germ, if you have not watched the clip of Big Germ and Kevin Jones at the press conference, it's uh, it's comedic gold. Germ's just wearing you know the sunglasses, the hat, and just answers the question, and then turns and stares at Kevin as Kevin tries to answer questions. But Germ says up front, he says, you know, I have not, I, I can't tell you how many times in practice I have said the words, my disc has never done that before. And Kevin throws the really flippy hyzer flips. It, it really gives him, you know, like Jerm said, an advantage at elevation and set up for Kevin to have a, what I think is without a doubt, Kevin's best weekend of any pro tour event thus far in the season. Yeah. I, I think he's really been looking for that, that spot again, you know, we're used to talking about him for a few years now and um, it's, I don't want to be cliche, but it, like obviously it's getting harder and harder to win. You just mentioned a bunch of names uh, in the lead up to this that are some of those guys like again and Burr making it really hard to to kind of stay up on that top level. But definitely good to see Kevin Jones there and and Freeman as well. Honestly, he's played really, really well. I mean, you talk about top tens and a podium in his last three starts. That's that's really good play out of Freeman. <laughs> it, it really is. So. You know, if you haven't had the opportunity to watch the match play championships, go check it out. It is on the Disc Golf Network. If you're a subscriber over there, it, a lot of fun to watch. The, there, there are there were some uh, lightning delays, but you know, skip through those. Get to watch some really entertaining golf, and at a course that absolutely gorgeous and definitely unlike a lot of courses that we get to play on tour right now. But I think the bigger questions and storylines that are looming over this event have to do kind of with the role of match play and the match play championship in the broader context of the Disc Golf Pro Tour. So I have a couple of topics that I want to hit with you, Jamie, in talking about the way that we should analyze this match play championship. First and foremost, 
we talked about Kevin Jones and Joel Freeman. Joel has had a couple top 10 finishes, a couple podium finishes, and has had what we all think was a pretty excellent season and has talked about the way he's kind of improving his game. If you go to Joel Freeman's social media, he talks about this as a disc golf pro tour win for him, which I mean, it is, but how much stock do you put in this event in terms of, you know, where you that this puts him relative to other players on the tour in terms of power rankings, or even what kind of momentum does this give him for the next stretch of the season and his ability to perform? I would say an event like this does more for the player than it does for the media or the fans. I mean, obviously, golf is golf, right? If you're throwing good shots one weekend and you can carry that on and keep that positive mental energy, go to the next weekend with that same kind of fire, that's great. And, you know, preserves one that I think a lot of players want to win this weekend, despite it being pretty new to the tour. But I guess Mm -hmm. as far as power rankings, I mean, it doesn't surprise me to see players do well in an event like this that, like, know how to be there at the end and try to close some things out. But I don't know. I'm kind of stretching it. I I really don't think it does a whole lot in terms of how we look at it. I think it's just it's an experiment. Like, is this interesting more than does this reveal something about where the player's at this year? Sure. I'm really I'm really curious. Like you said, if you're throwing good shots week in and week out, then that's something that does a lot for the player. I'm really interested to see if one, does this mean we're going to see Joel Freeman be competitive at the end of tournaments in you know moving forward? This head to head matchup. I mean, look, match play is an analogy that we use all the time when talking about final rounds. When two players have separated themselves, think of the commentators at the Portland Open when you had Simon Lazat and Garrett Gerthy. It was called match play at that point, right? Last six, seven holes, you say, well, at this point, they're just playing match play. It'll be interesting to see if this does well for Joel Freeman in just like a mental capacity. We know he's got the skills, but if mentally taking down a win like this is going to be something he's able to translate over on the flip side, I also wonder if Kevin Jones, you know, there's a lot of things to be happy about in taking second place, getting out of your pool, winning a semifinals match and taking home a nice paycheck. I really hope that this gives Kevin Jones a little bit of fuel going into the preserve and and then tournaments that he has historically done well at and won, such as Idlewild, for example, in the upcoming next stretch of the season. Yeah, because it's not like the rest of the field is just going to be like, oh, well, it's match play. I, I don't care. I think it's right, you know fun for these guys and girls to get out there and just do something a little bit different because the one thing is the tour is a grind we've heard mm-hmm. it out of the players over the last couple of years and, and obviously still trying to search for that like perfect setup for a season that makes everybody happy which hey, maybe that's impossible but you know just being able to do something like pool play and then match play heads up only playing 12 holes not having to play like an entire round every single day you still kind of get that competitive juices flowing and you so you get that benefit, but it doesn't feel like the same thing over and over. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. And, and absolutely. And Germ set speaks to that it just says he loves these events because uh, of the fun that they bring. So, you know, I, I want to then talk about the broader picture of how this fits in and what is the goal of match play championships in the eyes of the disc golf pro tour? Uh, We didn't have many of the top players here. The European women, obviously, who are not back yet on tour, but will be back for the preserve. Uh, You didn't have Paige, Katrina, and Valerie Mondahano dropped out last minute. Um, Over on the MPO side, Ricky out with injury and and was pretty indicative that he wouldn't be there. But Chris, not on this stretch of the tour. Um, you have Paul McBeth who took time off Calvin, who took time off to rest for not injury necessarily, but just rest Eagle who's dealing with injury. So a long litany of players, especially the top players in both divisions who chose not to participate in this event. Now, given that's the case, how problematic do you feel like that is for the image of the match play championships for the importance that it could hold in terms of just, is this going to be a priority? Because as you said, you know, it's a lot of fun for players to play and and I don't disagree with you on that, you know, that point, but the pro tour ponied up a lot of money for the players to have a fun weekend. Is, Is that just the end goal then is give a break in the routine or do you think that there are going to be steps taken and and moves may need to be made in order to attract the top players to come to this event as well 
Well, uh, I guess I should do the quick caveat that though I work for the tour, I'm not in any of like the tour operations meetings. So, um, yes. you know, Sorry, I, have no, I, I have no say in this and I'm not in the room, but I can definitely give my, my own kind of take on it. Yeah. The, I honestly don't see it as a high risk scenario for the tour. And, and here's okay. why. I'll, I'll put it to you as a question. Do you think in five years, the tour is going to is going to be trending in a better direction or a worse direction than it is right now? Just your personal opinion. Better direction. I like upward trajectory. Do you also think that in five years, even if we're like peaking and sort of plateauing in terms of the, the post pandemic growth of disc golf, do you think, let's say the trough of that wave after it crests will be higher than it was pre pandemic? Yes. So kind of given those things, the way I see it is let's roll the dice. Let's experiment a little bit. Let's do it before the stakes get incredibly high and sort of see what type of uh, formats interest people. Let's see, you know, does it does it truly matter if certain players aren't there? And you can look at the the numbers. I haven't seen the numbers for this weekend, but, you know, you look at the metrics and sort of make those decisions. And if you do it now, as opposed to later, when you know that you know, the tour merger was just signed. So there's no danger of that there. We're working in super close coordination with the PDJ. It's very happy marriage. Um, you know, you've got a backer and our ownership group that wants to see this succeed and, and really has put the players first. Um, and, you know, when you when you kind of stack those things up, I like that there's a willingness to experiment and a willingness just to kind of get out there and, and say, all right, let's see, you know, and please give us the feedback. Do you like this? Do you not like this? And and we can kind of go from there. And because I think like we're far from settled when we look back on this in 5, 10, 15 years. You know, I, I don't think the little things are gonna matter as much. I don't know, maybe that's too much of an inside view. What do you think? No, no, I think it's a really good point. Cause when I came into this, I was kind of comparing it with and, and I know we have an all-stars event, but I was kind of comparing it with sports that have the all-stars event somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. uh, of the season and then kind of what those attendance rates look like and whether or not that's a problem for those sports. Uh, you know, when you have Aaron Judge, for example, choose to opt out of the home run derby uh, when in the NBA, you know, half the all-stars who are voted in don't play in the all-star game. Uh, but though I would say NBA participant participation is, is higher. And then, you know, on the flip side, you have the NFL Pro Bowl that is not watched hardly at all in terms of, for a competitive nature, but it's fun to see some of those same players and especially the skills contest that goes into that week, which, you know, the all-star weekend definitely featured. But when you kind of compare as that broader picture, I think the way you put it is really insightful because in my, I, in my head, I was like, Oh, well, if you don't, aren't going to attract the top talent, then what is the point when you compare this as a competitive endeavor but maybe the better way to look at it is that this is beta testing for what could be a more expanded competitive event, or maybe it's just one that is done as a break and stop along the way for players who want to earn a little extra well, or a lot of extra cash, uh, but doesn't feel like a high priority for those who, who don't want it and still gives the fans a, a good weekend. So I think that's a really insightful way to put it. And one thing to think about as we continue to grow is, you know, are we going to see a schedule where, hey, not every Elite Series event is going to have everybody in it? Or are we going to sort of pare down the schedule to make sure that every Elite Series has the top players in it each week? And there's there's sort of, you know, diverging uh, opinions on that, I think, in the wider disc golf world of whether we should have less events or just have more opportunities. And, mm -hmm. you know, so we're kind of figuring all that out right now in that vein. And the other thing I think is very uh, unique or, or at least crucial to this season is look at how backloaded the schedule is. I mean, we're doing five events in like seven weeks, starting the last weekend in August between Worlds, the two playoff events at Green Mountain and MVP. And then you have USDGC and Throw Pink and then the Tour Championship. I think a lot of these um, guys and girls are looking at how many events we've already played this year. And saying, you know, wow, we've still got Europe ahead of us and we still have that, you know, grand finale ending to 2022. So let's let's keep the body fresh if, if we have the opportunity to at all. Sure. Well, and I think part of there, there's another problem that's 
plaguing, uh, plaguing is maybe not the right word, but that I think a dilemma that disc golf has to, to wrestle with. When you look at the skill level between top athletes in the NBA, for example, you have, you know, you're, you have clear superstars and we, you know, have the fortune of watching a couple of those right now who are just one of a kind and, you know, enter themselves into the GOAT discussions. But to say that an all-star event without LeBron James or Steph Curry, for example, is now one that is void of the top, you know, just the top most exceptional talent in the world is, is absolutely not the case. Mm -hmm. The problem with disc golf is we talk about the tiers of players and the tier one, the, the, the top of the top is a relatively small enough group and is seen as being significantly, or at least their skill level is a high enough difference between that tier. And then the next group of players, I mean, Eagle, Paul, Ricky, Calvin, Chris. After that, I mean, once if, if all five of those guys are there, how many people at a major are going to put somebody not of those five on their podium? At that point, it's it's a shot in the dark. I mean, those guys are, are just so dominant. Mm -hmm. FPO side, Kristen, Paige, Katrina, right? You have that group. And so when a Pro Tour event doesn't feature the full slate every time you lose one of those players, it's, oh, well, it's just not as strong of a field this time. And so I think with a match play championship that doesn't feature any of those players, it was really easy for player, for fans to look at that and say, oh, well, well, this event doesn't really have much of a competitive edge. But I think as folks like Gannon Burr and other players continue to develop in their talent, Ella Hansen gets more experience. Uh, and, and the gap between the top group of players and then the rest of the field continues to shrink. I don't think it's going to be quite as big of a consequence if you're missing out on the top player on tour right now, because you still have, you know, just a ton of exceptional talent right behind them. And you'll learn something about some of these other players too. You know, the fact that it's a different format in the first place mm -hmm. means that, okay, you know, maybe we're not going to see uh Macbeth moving day. Okay, great. You know, he can birdie every hole, but he's only getting one point per hole on that. He's not gaining on the entire field. So, sure. you know, some of the the just the construction of the event itself, uh, it shows a little bit of a different priority order in terms of what skill set gets you to the end of the weekend. And I would look at it, you know, in a glass half full type way and say, like, let's find out what some of these other players have in terms of skill sets, uh, because we know from experience over the last decade or so that if you put them in five rounds of stroke play on a really hard course, ratings will tell you uh and, and the results <laughs> bear out there's only a handful of people winning world titles you know what i mean right yeah absolutely uh one one other side note you know and, and this is something that i mentioned incredible payouts from the pro tour again for this event ten thousand dollars for both first place winners five thousand dollars for second place and, and the opportunity, I think, for some of these players has been enormous. When when you talk about ten thousand dollars for Paul or Ricky relative to their contracts, Kristen Page, you know, it, it's significant, but it's not life changing by any means. If you look at the season earnings of the players who won this weekend, though, it's hard to imagine that this wasn't some serious money that they really, really could use. Own, for example, her season earnings thus far, $18,219. So more than 50% of her season earnings now came in this single payout. Joel Freeman, $20,619 right at the 50% mark. So big paydays for both of these players have to be thrilled to be taking home $10,000 checks. And, and it's really cool to see players who earn this kind of money and how honestly life-changing it is, or at least season changing. And when Charlie and I talked to, to Aaron Gossage, for example, we talked to him about the $3,000 payday that he got after a podium finish. And, you know, he said that this it gave him the opportunity to take a weekend off from playing an A tier because he knew that he had enough money to be able to do so. I don't know if Joel and Owen are in that same boat for sure, but to see a paycheck that's 50% of your season's earnings thus far must be a really, really nice weekend. Oh, yeah. And I mean, as much as hype and press as we give the top players in the sport for their, you know, million dollar deals and all that stuff, mm -hmm. there are still these players who are extremely talented and extremely dedicated to touring each week that, that, don't get that. And, you know, right. so they're fighting for media appearances so that they can sell more tour discs and they're really trying to scratch 
place by place in order to kind of, like you're saying, make that next week just a little bit easier. And I think that's something that we forget a lot of times about these players is like, you know, every little bit that they can make their life easier week to week, paycheck to paycheck, that stress being off of their shoulders and allowing them to play at their absolute best is better for the game overall because it makes the top even more competitive and it makes the savvy veterans have to really, really be on their game and not mess up. Or one of these newer players, I mean, think about an Isaac Robinson type back at Portland. Like they're yes. coming for your lunch money if you don't defend it. If you're complacent earning a big paycheck, these players are hungry. And so ultimately that's really good for the sport, I think. Yeah, I, I think so too. Uh, there were spectators at this event and we got an email from Adam who, shout out to Adam, not only for sending us an email and a dedicated listener, but also as a Denver Broncos fan. So a man <laughs> near and dear to my heart. <laughs> he's also said he's an Avs fan, uh, Avalanche in the finals right now, two, up two to one on the Tampa Bay Lightning. So congratulations right now to Adam. Uh, but Adam sends us an email. Pretty, you know, a lot of the email says that things like there were some food vendors, bathroom situation was good. Overall, amenities were in good shape. There was time between rounds to kind of take a break and relax. And so it sounds like a, a well-run pro tour event for spectator experience in a lot of ways. But there was one part that I, I really wanted to highlight that I think was just incredible. He says, I had several friends who went to the tournament and we all had amazing experiences meeting and talking to various FPO and MPO pl players who we all found to be very polite and approachable. Uh, and on Friday, several pros were hanging out in the tournament central area, chatting, signing autographs and playing cornhole with the fans. What an amazing opportunity. And I think a valuable opportunity as access to pros, you know, as the sport grows, access to pros is going to decrease and diminish as well. I think that's just kind of an inevitability of a growing sport. But for the match play, because of the more relaxed, it's not quite as, you know, the same cutthroat next you know you're around every day that you're prepping for um offering that kind of player experience what an awesome opportunity for fans to get to play cornhole with uh with some of the pros i mean i that just that really sticks out to me as being an excellent spectator experience yeah and that's that's the thing is I, we're in a very interesting point where like you're saying that we do have to sort of manage access because of how many people are coming out to these events. I mean, the last one I was at was Portland and the crowd was incredible there. One of the biggest galleries that we've ever seen in the sport. And, you know, everybody wants a piece of their time. So you kind of have to manage that and, and you got to say, okay, and they got to go to the autograph tent here. You can't They can't stop every five feet when they've just done their scorecards kind of thing. <laughs> um, but the fact that they we do still have that. And I remember Owen Scoggins at Portland in line to get a Bevel Craft brew. And one of the fans <laughs> was like, oh, I'm buying it for you. And like and, you know, uh, so they got to share a beer together and, uh, you know, even more special because it came from some world champions who were brewing that beer. So it's uh, there's still that like golden hour. You know, we call it the magic hour in filming, like right before the sunset when you mm -hmm. get the best shots. If you want the best access to the pros, I mean, obviously be really respectful of their time and energy when you're out there. But like now's the time to start getting out there because, yeah, in a few years, you can't help it. Like it's, we all see the writing on the wall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. So I, I hope that this tournament gives us the opportunity for continued exposure, right? If it was set up and designed explicitly for that fan and spectator interaction with the pros, I think this event could hold a really special place in terms of spectator experience that a lot of fans would really love to come be a part of. So yeah, big, big shout out to the Pro Tour, Pro Tour for that. Um, all right, Jamie, I want to give you the opportunity now. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And after the break, we're going to have you talk about some of the projects going on at the Disc Golf Pro Tour. So stay with us. You're listening to The Upshot. The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. Right now, you can pre-order the 2022 Ambassador Deluxe Octothorpe. Whether you prefer the steel and turquoise colored Nate Sexton version or Big Germ's Ranger Green dipped in black with Bordeaux accents, both just absolutely beautiful bags, the limited edition Ambassador Octothorps include a special Ambassador patch as well as all of the upgrades including Velcro patches, a scorecard pocket, and wider long pockets. Go to pounddiscgolf.com and pre-order yours today. Welcome 
welcome back to The Upshot. We are now going to take the opportunity to talk, Jamie, a little bit about some of your adventures that have been going on over at the Disc Golf Pro Tour. I know you just got back from a trip over in Montenegro, and I am thoroughly intrigued by this trip, and I'm excited to hear what you guys have been up to over there. Yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun. So, um, you know, you may have noticed that I'm not on the live broadcast anymore. Uh, I've actually kind of moved on from the live broadcast team back into sort of my native wheelhouse, which is more like doing film based projects. Um, I say film more as like a workflow uh, than sure. actual like movies. Mm -hmm. But, you know, starting up different shows and, and really trying to expand the horizons of the disc golf network. If you were to boil my job into one sentence right now, it's, you know, prove to everybody that, that the disc golf network is more than just live broadcast. So one of the things that we're doing is uh, working on some great off-season content. So when the tournament's end for the year, you still have a reason to subscribe. And we're able to kind of tell some of the stories that we're not able to do when we're in that week-in, week-out type of grind. So to that effect, uh, we just got back from Montenegro. And actually, for the same reason that Paul Macbeth wasn't at the Match Play Championships, he was out there as well doing a project for his foundation in a town called Nitsic, which is a town of about, I think, like 30,000 people, roughly. And we were designing and installing the first disc golf course in the country of Montenegro. And it's a collaboration between the Paul Macbeth Foundation and Avery Jenkins designing it for Disc Golf Park. We have a show with Avery called Finding the Lines. So last year that started out as uh, Avery and Simon designing a course in Nashua, New Hampshire. And this year we kind of stepped it up a notch and said, hey, we're going to put some more resources into this project because we think that course design and installation is something that's still pretty opaque to a lot of people or and hopefully interesting to see, you know, what does it take to get a course from idea to in the ground playable? So that's what we were over there doing. Uh, Avery went and designed the course back in May. We sent him over there with his phone to do some vlogging, and we took a crew back in June. We built, we installed, and we grand opened a course in the span of about five days. And wow. spoiler <laughs> alert, no heavy machinery. This was wheelbarrows, shovels, and pickaxes, <laughs> and hoping to God that we were going to get this done in time uh, for the grand opening on the Friday. But it, it was a lot of fun. That, that sounds like an incredible experience. Um, so you were there, you said for five days, what kind of local support did you have while you were installing that? Yeah. So the local, our, our local guy, uh, Vukashin Bausik, he, uh, obviously this is through the Paul Macbeth foundation. So the foundation mm -hmm. selected him, uh, his bid and selected his city to be one of their next projects. And uh, basically two film crews were out there. So Jomez Pro, as they have done for some other Paul Macbeth Foundation projects, they do a little docu-series sort of on the backstory of mm -hmm. the project. Um, I highly recommend that when that video is out, you guys go check that out. Um, they're also going to have a practice round video coming out. Um, and just like, the, it's going to be fantastic. So definitely check that out on Jomez. Um, they're going to be out before us. We're the other film crew there. And our story features a little bit more about how the course was made and some of the challenges that befell the crew as we were trying to get this course done and how we overcame them. And we also talk a lot about Avery's design principles, you know, how he goes about designing a course for beginners, the first course in a country, taking the challenges of, of the terrain and the place he was given to turn that into something that, that everybody will love. So this was probably the most covered disc golf course d installation in the history of the sport um, between the two crews. And, and it's really going to be some awesome footage, beautiful country, um, delicious food, super cool people, and and just a very feel good story for, for disc golf and hashtag grow the sport. When will we be able to find inside the lines season two uh, on the disc golf network? It will come out probably uh, late November. So we'll okay. have an episode a week type thing. Um, we have a couple projects that are in the works, uh, an even bigger project uh, than the Finding the Lines project is in the works as well. And our plan is to kind of release those um, 
as the the tour season ends in mid-October, we'll start dropping those episodes week by week to get you through your holidays, get you through your off season. And then before you know it, it's going to be time for the 2023 season again. (laughs) That's right. Uh, That sounds like an incredible project. And I know I cannot wait to watch uh, this, this story. It's one that I think is exciting to see about disc golf representation and you know as the paul Macbeth foundation does in areas that are underrepresented and haven't had the opportunity to participate in the sport so i'm excited to, to see your work on that project what else is going on at the disc golf pro tour jamie that you know you're a part of and that you can speak to a little bit yeah i kind of mentioned a, a big project that we're working on and I, i'm really excited we haven't done a lot of big formal announcements about this yet so this is like sort of early access here for the upshot. Um, You know, you'll start seeing more and more about this project in the coming months. Um, And we are taking the concept of, I don't know if you've seen like F1 Drive to Survive on Netflix, Uh sort of these um, story of the season docuseries access shows. Uh, Another one that I've loved for a very long time is Hard Knocks over on HBO that follows uh, NFL teams through training camp. So, um, we are doing a show like that for the Disc Golf Network. It's going to be a six-part, hour-long episode docu-series on what happened this year. Super excited about this. Um, Corey Merle is our director of photography on this. You know, many fans will know him from his Johnny Disc Golf channel and his Central Coast days. He's now full-time with the tour. So we're working closely on that. Um, we also have Dustin Wolf, who runs the Disc Golf Ledger YouTube channel. He's on this crew. And um, a guy who Upshot fans might remember, Joe Canale. This man has won multiple Emmys. Uh, he has, He's worked with every league, you know, World Cup, Stanley Cup, NFL Draft. He cuts all the stuff for the top tier sports uh, in, the, in the world, basically. And he essentially has the rest of his year locked out to work on this project with us. So, you know, we're really kind of pulling together a lot of powerful resources on this show. And this is going to give you a little insight into what goes on outside of the tournaments. You know, it's a lot more about the players, the people behind the sport, what it's like to be on the road and and sort of give you some of that experience uh, that you don't, you know, get during the year. So I'm, I'm so excited for that project. I cannot wait for everybody to see it. So a couple, I I know this is early access. So if you can't answer then that's okay. But has this show been marketed to, like companies like Netflix or other streaming sites to try and host this series on other streaming services that aren't on the Disc Golf Network? Yeah, so that's part of the distribution plan. Uh, We are going to pitch this to some other networks. But the one thing, this show kind of rose out of the ashes of our previous ESPN type shows that we were making. And, you know, one thing that we really wanted to change was... When we did those shows and put them on linear cable, we had a lockout period in the contract where we couldn't put it on DGN for a while. And so we sort of have flipped the script a little bit, and this will definitely be on the Disc Golf Network no matter what. And then we will use that as sort of a test case to go to these other networks uh, and say, hey, you know, is this something that you'll be interested in for your audience? Because, you know, to, to a Hulu or a Netflix or something like that, Disc Golf Network is is a drop in the bucket and that's not sure. to diminish efforts, but like it's not going to prevent them from wanting to show it to a wider audience if it's well received. And we just we want to make sure that disc golfers get to see this show. Oh, I, I mean, that sounds incredible. Now, I have another question. Yeah. In sports, one of the greatest superstitions is on the curse of things like, I mean, hard knocks uh, on things like I, I it's hard knocks where the team that's featured in Hard Knocks has a good season or is it they they usually they bad. tank as well. It's usually bad. Okay, that's what I thought. They, so after Hard Knocks, the team always goes down the hole. If you get the Madden uh you know if mm-hmm. if you're featured on Madden, then you know that player's going to have a terrible season. You never take him in fantasy. Uh it, are you worried about cursing some of these players <laughs> in your show to having a bad season next year? Well, I hope not. Um <laughs> you know, these days, all these players are are doing a lot of vlogs and sort of media making on their own anyway. So it, it's true. a pressure that they put on themselves a lot of the time. And my pitch to them is, you know, hey, like, leave that out of your mind. Let let the people who do it full time take care of that. And you can be on camera for a little bit and kind of do your thing. Uh, and you don't have to worry about what happens 
do the editing, do the publishing, do the hype and marketing behind all that. So I, you know, maybe a few years ago, I would have said, oh, we got to worry about that. But I'll tell you what, man, (laughs) these, especially these younger kids who are getting into the game, they're already just steps beyond in terms of Mm -hmm. like media readiness, you know, being able to be on camera and still kind of be themselves. It's, it's a really fascinating thing about the younger generation generally, I think. Yeah, I, I'll be interested. I'm going to watch every player that's featured on your show. I'm going to track their results from one season to the next and see right. if there's a general trend. So you're, you're going to be held accountable for this, Jamie. All uh, right. <laughs> but I, I think that's really fascinating what you talk about, you know, the younger players coming in. It's just milestones. I see on Instagram images from like Innova's junior team and there's, you know, seven year olds doing disc reviews and showing, you know, them throwing. And, and that's just a microcosm of, of the increase of the exposure via social media, YouTube and vlogs. Um, do you feel like so when you had your players that you selected and I, I don't know who's on was and you told me this pitch of, well, let us take care of some of that for you. Did you have players who were hesitant or resistant to that because they were worried about time commitments? Did most of them feel, oh, great, I don't have to worry about this as much on my own? What what was kind of that general player perception in terms of time commitment versus exposure? Well, it's interesting because, um, you know, fortunately, I've been doing disc golf media for about 12 years now. So I have a mm-hmm. good relationship with a lot of the players. And that's so important, you know, that that they trust that we're not there to do gotcha journalism. We're not there to make them look bad. I tell them like, you're a rock star. All the stuff you do that is not captured. You know, it's only shown what you do on the course, but you do so much more as a professional athlete and as someone who wants to grow your own brand. Mm -hmm. Let's show that. So we're here to make you look good. Um, And so, you know, that definitely helps that I I do feel like I and my team, we have the trust of a lot of the pros. Um, And also, I think that, you know, it is getting harder to get access to these players, especially at the top because their time commitments. I mean, we just talked about Paul Macbeth. I mean, you probably saw on his Instagram, like he flew out to Montenegro to do that project. And then he flew down, you know, to be like a VIP at, at a UFC fight. And then he's going to uh-huh. bust up to the preserve and play that. So you have these athletes who are really starting to, to move up the levels of recognition in the wider world. And so you have to be respectful of their time and, and you have to sort of, tailor the approach to each person in the way that, you know, you can say, Hey, we have a common goal here. And that's sort of uh, that's sort of the individual challenge. Everybody's a little bit different. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, anything else over at the disc golf pro tour and the disc golf network that, you know, our listeners should, should know about that are coming up. Still, we got a lot more coming out uh, besides the projects I mentioned. There's going to be a variety of things. You know, we want to eventually get into instructional type content. We want to get into like form breakdowns and uh, how to make your game better. I mean, I know you've been I don't know if you've been seeing Philo on the live broadcast, the way he breaks down some of these players forms like Mm -hmm. mid round. We want to expand on concepts like that. So um, I'm also working with the PDGA. We're going to try to hunt down a lot of the historical footage, you know, from national tours and majors past. We want that to be on the network. We want it to be where like you can plug in and see all kinds of things, you know, whether you're into the history of the game, Roots of Flight is coming back this season, whether you're into, uh, you know, bettering your own game or just following your favorite players, that that's the goal is we want to be the place where if you're a fan of the sport, we've got something for you. So you know, always working, but, um, I'll shout out. I don't know if you've seen it. The, the David Wiggins little short documentary that Corey Merle just did and released okay. about a week ago. Super fun to see David Wiggins and, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully we see him out there sometime soon. Yeah. I I've seen the ads for it. It looks incredible. I've not had the opportunity to watch, so I'll, I'll definitely make sure to check that out. Put it on your list. Uh, dude. Will do. I, it's, it's a long, it's a long list. Yeah, right. that's, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, Jamie, I want to say thank you so much for coming on guest hosting with me. Thank you for the updates about the disc golf network. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you as always. And, uh, I hope that we have you again in the future. Yeah. Thanks Josh. And, uh, I know it's always fun in the discord. We mix it up, put our opinions in there a little bit. So I'll take the <laughs> moment and shout out, plug that, uh, subscribe to Ulti World, get in the Discord. It's a lot of fun. If you love what Josh and Charlie and everybody else talks about on the show, you kind of get to have your own opinions in there and you never know who you run into. So uh, what's Charlie say? Cup of coffee, 
uh, a month or something like that. With inflation, that, it's like a half right. a cup these days. So <laughs> it's a good deal Look, for you know. It's still less than four dollars a month. While your groceries are going up in price, your subscription is not. <laughs> so subscribe to Ulti World. Join us in the Discord. Uh, you get access to a lot of other content, and it is only less. It is less than four dollars a month. Uh, we're gonna take a quick break. Afterwards, I will be interviewing Danny Boss for a PDGA check-in. Stay right here. You're listening to the Upshot. now on the upshot is the director of marketing for the pdga danny voss here for a pdga check-in danny thanks for joining us good to be here josh thank you so you are at the amateur world championships right now uh, in indiana is that correct yeah the uh, am worlds are in southern indiana right now and i am at the princeton country club uh getting a little cool air and uh, peace and quiet for the interview and the cool thing is that I'm looking to my right and I can see hole 13, uh, the players putting on that green. So it's not a bad spot. I might need to post up here for a little bit longer. Yeah, nothing wrong with sitting in the country club. How's the championship been going? Uh, pretty well so far. Um, there's a lot of players here. I think last I looked, there was 411 players uh, as of my check last night. So assuming they all got in and checked in and didn't have any drops, uh, you know, it's a pretty good field between the MA1 and FA1 fields. Um, Yeah, it's a, so, so far so good. And uh, this, this course here looks beautiful. This uh, immaculate country course and uh, country club course. And uh, yeah, flow looks good. I haven't noticed any backups. Like things are, things are moving along. You know, running a tournament of of that skill with no backups is is an impressive feat. So uh, a question for you. Uh, We have three amateur championships, really, uh, that kind of give us a look at some of the top players in the country. You have the junior world championships. uh, You have, and specifically in the 18 under division, you have Mm -hmm. the amateur world championships, and then you have the United States amateur championships, which just concluded a couple weeks ago. How should one weigh those tournaments in terms of prestige when you're looking at who might be a ne- another up and coming player to watch on the professional scene? Uh, wow, that's a really good question. I'd like to add that the U.S. Women's Disc Golf Championship also crowns um, the you know FA1, FA2, uh, sure. all of those amateur fields as well. So that's the, the women's side of that. So. Um, you know, this is just my gut reaction and this is not a branded answer at all, but I mean, I got to say it's the world championships. I mean, that's the one that everybody wants. Um, but you know, oddly enough, I, you know, there's, there haven't been a lot of people that have won both the U S um, the U S am title and the, um, U S or the am world title in the Mm -hmm. same year. Um, I know Anthony Barella did it and I only know it because I was at both of those tournaments getting like, you know, 75th place or something like that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So he did that in like 2015. So, and, you know, he's obviously a a, a star on the tour and, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, still has a lot of potential in front of him despite his, you know, uh, great skill set and and success. Um, But yeah, I mean, I, I would have to say the, the worlds, but, I mean, those those U.S. titles are are hard to come by too, and so I mean, a player should be proud of of getting a getting that one on their uh, on their record with a M next to it. You know, that's a that's a good oh, distinction yeah. and something to be proud of for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. Speaking of M's that we're getting ready for, the European Open is just under a month away, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. right around a month. Um, so, you know, we're getting ready for the next major. U.S. Women's is, is coming up as well. What is going on with preparations for the European Open in particular uh, for the, on the PDGA side? Yeah. Um, you know, UC, UC Marisma is mm-hmm. kind of the mastermind behind that event, uh, which is great because, you know, it's a known commodity with, with that guy. And he, uh, he knows how to put on a tournament, a world-class tournament. Um, you know, we're really fortunate to have this partnership with DGPT and DGN to help provide that live coverage, which is a unique 
uh, value add for this year. And hopefully, you know, that can go well so that uh, in future iterations of the event, that will be a uh, component there. Um, so between between those two entities and then plus the normal PDGA support, like as in, you know, so, you know, providing extra advertising space and trying to connect, uh, uh, you know, perhaps um, sponsors and things like that. You know, this event is going to be is going to be fantastic. And I'm really excited to to witness it. And yeah, it follow it follows masters and juniors worlds too. So right now is definitely our busy season, you know, with AM worlds and then us women's is like in is next weekend, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and then masters juniors worlds and then European open. <laughs> and then we finally get a little bit of a break for, I don't know, a couple of weeks. And then that pro worlds ramp up is going to be right around the corner. So Yeah. Pretty busy stuff, but yeah, the, the European Open is going to be really exciting for sure. I can't wait. Yeah, and especially given the pause on that tournament for the past couple of years due mm-hmm. to COVID, it's one that I think a lot of people are anticipating and, and excited to see. Have you had the yeah. opportunity to go to the European Open before? I will. You I will? will have the opportunity this year, <laughs> so to finally make that happen, I'm really, uh, obviously, I'm really excited for that, and um, it's going to be it's going to be good to get over there and and shake hands with some of the people in Finland that are really driving the sport in uh, Europe. Um, you know, this is as a membership organization, it, it takes all, hold on, let me get this number right. 108,484 active members to, you know, make this sport successful and, and continue to grow and be, and grow in a good way. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big base of those people over there in Europe, specifically in Finland that are, um, you know, really driving it. So I'm excited to go over there and, and meet some of those people and see what the PDJ uh, here in the U.S. can do to to support that, you know, have some real honest conversations and and uh, meet people face to face, you know, the, the good old pre-COVID style. Good old pre-COVID style. Get to have a handshake. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you mentioned 108,000 active members uh, over at the PDGA. Have you been seeing those numbers continue to climb? Do they, have they, you know, started to slow down? What does that growth rate still look like for the PDGA relative, obviously, to the boom during COVID years? Sure, that's a that's another good question. So our growth is still excellent. Um, it is not like the 50 percent growth compared to 20, you know. 2019, 2020 that we saw sure. in 2021. I mean, last year was literally explosive in those numbers. However, um, we're still seeing above um, above the growth standard that we had pre-COVID, but again, relative to that 2021 like post-COVID boom. So that like that like 15 to 20 percent number that we historically were striving for is still getting met in this post COVID scale. So um, that's, that's a long way of saying that membership is still growing. Well, it's steady. Um, Things are more representation all across the globe. Um, You know, Europe is Europe in particular is experiencing a lot of growth. Um, And we're seeing that here at AM worlds. I mean, there's decent representation from um, our European countries here. So it's exciting to see um, that growth be manifested in some representation, you know, at the world championships. And so um, overall, everything is is running really smoothly and, and really well. And uh, yeah, excited to see what this uh, European Open might um, manifest as far as, you know, additional memberships abroad and, and uh, in, increased engagement because, you um, one thing that I didn't mention was, you know, UC anticipates there being a significant gallery. Um, and he's saying that with the context of, you know, 2019, we were blown away by the size of the gallery then. And he's like, oh, right. I wouldn't be surprised if it's double. So, you know, that's that's kind of indicative of of the sustained growth and the, and the sustainable approach that the membership team is taking to it. So, um yeah, I'm really excited for for all of those things to just kind of come together. Uh, that's incredible. And if if European Open doubles, how many spectators? Because I thought the number I remember hearing thrown around was something like five thousand spectators. 
It's yeah, the last iteration. I, I, that's kind of what we're thinking here. Is like it's gonna get, it's gonna climb over that five thousand mark. Wow. Um, for that final day at, at least, and uh, and hey, I mean, I I hope to see it. I hope that there's a yeah. uh, you know, it, it's a unique situation there too because it's a great big wide open public park, and so it's a, mm -hmm. it, you know, there's going to be amenities for. Um, you know, ticket holders, but it's, it's more of a conventional, you know, approach to, to how disc golf spectating was, you know, and more historically. So it's, sure. it's going to be fun to see that old and new kind of come together. And again, I think it's going to be a really good thing in, in the grand scheme of uh, the growth of the sport. Absolutely. Now we just need worlds over in Europe. So, Oof. Hey, hey, look, I, I'd be lying <laughs> if I said that, you know, that was that wasn't on the table. I mean, everybody wants to see something like that, and it's just a mm -hmm. matter of getting getting the team, like all the teams, in place. But hey, it's not like uh, it's not like we don't want that to happen. That's a that's oh. a huge goal for everybody. I believe it. I, I know the logistics must be enormous though in order for that to happen. So, Danny, you were talking about player representation from the diverse areas of you know the world in terms of that representation at tournaments whether that be the European Open or the Amateur World Championship right now. But let's talk about another representation. Right now, the PDGA is hosting its elections for the Global Board of Directors. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that race and everything that's going on with it? Yeah, that's right. So um, right now, there are 13 candidates that are in the running for two Board of Directors seats on the PDGA Global Board of Directors. Um we are the PDJ media team is conducting interviews that'll go on the PDJ or go along with PDJ radio um, podcast. They'll probably be distributed as several separate inter, uh, episodes. Um, in the meantime, you can go on to pdj.com and search for the board of directors, um, uh, get to know the 13 candidates and you can read their candidate statements and any media that they provided ahead of time. Um, yeah, and so we'll get those uh, interviews out on our PDJ Radio podcast probably by Monday. Uh, that'll give everybody a week to, uh, you know, check out those episodes, hear from the candidates themselves. Uh, I think Grant is uh, keeping those episodes to about 15 minutes a piece. So nice and short and sweet, good enough for a commute. Maybe you can get a couple of those in. Um, and then uh, in addition to the global candidates, um, there is also five European board of directors, uh, candidates that are looking for, I believe, three seats on that board. Um, so both of those open July 1st and both close on July 31st. So there's plenty of time to get in and get educated on the candidates and, and vote for who you think is, uh, going to serve the membership best in that, in those board seats. Um, yeah, it's a, it's exciting. It's always it's good to see this kind of democratic process play out for, you know, the representing the 108 plus um that 108,000 plus members. So, it's a it's a good thing to be a part of and it would be great to see, a, you know, a high engagement rate here with the uh, member voting. So, um I encourage everybody to look out for that email on July 1st and and get educated and submit their votes. And what what percentage of PDGA active members typically vote in these elections? You know, I could answer that question. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of answer it in a little bit of the snarky way. Okay. It's, it's pretty much in line with your U.S. general election numbers. It's not as favorable as you might want to see. I guess this last this last presidential one was a little bit higher than normal, but that, you know, 20 to 30 percent would be you know, up there in one of the most highly participated elections for the PDJ Board of Directors. So, I, you know, there's, it's free to do. It's a really easy way to get an impactful way to get your voice heard by, by voting for the uh, candidates that represent, um, you know, where you want to see the PDJ go. Um, so again, I really encourage people to do it. It takes, you know, five minutes uh, to actually do the voting. If that, that's probably an overestimation. And then um, just taking the time to to listen to the podcast and read their candidate statements. And, um, you know, a lot of members might know these people. They might be campaigning and everything else like that. So, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities to learn about uh, who these representatives will be. So 
enga- engagement and involvement is uh, is paramount, and I encourage all the members to participate. Well, and it, it I think the larger an organization gets, the harder it is to direct change from a grassroots level. Mm-hmm. And you know the PDGA is growing rapidly, but it's still in a very developmental stage as an organization. And so, I mean, I, I echo what you're saying that I really think if you are a PDGA member, go vote because now is a really critical time in the direction of our sport. And you can play a big role in that by participating in these elections. Most definitely. So Danny, what are some other, I mean, I kind of want to give you the, the floor a little bit to tell us about some other updates of things going on over at the PDGA that some of our members might and listeners might be interested to hear about. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we already talked about uh, the fact that I'm out here at Am Worlds. So we have uh, two production companies coming out here. They're dedicating uh, their time to the lead card of MA1 and the lead card of FA1 all week. Um, so that's really cool. Our feature card for FA1, by the way, it features four different nations. So um, the U.S., uh, Japan, Germany, and... I believe the UK. So a uh, really wow. cool representation there. Um, you know, and we'll just see how the, you know, the leaders come up and then it'll be that, you know, traditional coverage style. Um, but we are, we're also expanding our media coverage for the other majors as well. So U S women's is next week. And so because of our, you know, extremely valuable partnership with DGPT and DGN, they're covering, you know, live, uh, live broadcasts of U.S. Women's, which is great. Um, Joe Mez will be covering the uh, FA1. GK Pro is covering FA2. So uh, I'm sorry, not I'm speaking in the amateur <laughs> sense again. I'm sorry. Uh, FPO1 and FPO2. Okay. And then um, the us at the PDGA, we're also contracting um, some other media teams to cover FP40. And um, so you'll get to see, you know, your on Scoggins, Jennifer Allen, you know, potentially those types of stars. And then also we're going to have another car, uh, coverage card out there that's going to kind of bounce around and, and showcase some of the other divisions like FA1, you know, maybe some other junior divisions, maybe some, um, uh, you know, FA50, like those types of divisions spread the love a little bit and give them a chance to kind of experience the spotlight. Um, so we're going to have, I think, believe that we're um, going to have that just kind of bouncing around and, and giving some uh, attention to those other, those other ladies that are out there competing. It'll be fun. Um, same with Masters and Juniors Worlds. We're going to have probably four cards covered, the top Masters cards and the top Juniors cards. And, and then like we hit on a little bit earlier, you know, the European Open is going to have DGN and stuff like that. And all of that is fueled by a lot of these like cooperative partnerships, um, not the least of which is, is us and DGPT and, and their disc golf network, but all that. And then, yeah, it's a, it's really exciting. So there will be no shortage of uh, disc golf coverage by the, by the end of the summer. That's for sure. So I guess I'll uh, make sure your, you know, popcorn maker or microwave or whatever is, is in good working order. Cause you're going to need it in the, and make sure that your uh, YouTube, you know, ad blockers on or whatever you guys need to <laughs> watch that. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, you know, and I, I love that about on the U.S. women's side, because something we've talked about a lot before is that the U.S. Women's Championship, while it is a competitive major, is also seen as a celebration and, and an opportunity to bring, you know, a diverse group of women together yeah. to, for that championship. And so for coverage to reflect that, I think is excellent. And that's a, and that's one of the exciting things about the U.S. Women's Tournament uh, is is that you know the, these these competitors that are playing you know FA two or you know FJ eighteen or or whatever they're getting a chance to go meet you know Paige and Katrina and and um, you know Kristen and all these other comp- F- FPO competitors that they're watching on GK Pro and on DJ DGN and stuff. And they're getting there to actually meet them at a competition. And, um, and there's no, there's no distractions of like those other divisions of like the MPO divisions or MA1 or something like that. It's like, it's a chance for the, for those competitors to, to meet and come together. And, uh, you know, that's something special. And so, you know, how that evolves into the future, we'll see how that goes. Um, but, 
for now, it's, it, I think that's something special about that event. And, um, and uh, I think that the uh, competitors that show up, which I think is up to like 330 competitors right now uh, for that event, I think they should all just revel in that opportunity because it's, you know, that's not very common in other sports um, to get to, you know, be an amateur and, and see your professional world-class idols <laughs> compete on those same courses right next to you. So it's, it's a really neat opportunity. Yeah, without a doubt. Uh, any other updates? So you, I think you had mentioned to me, you got some competition stuff that are some changes coming down. What, yeah, what does that all right. entail? Um, so we have a, we do have a special, um, uh, master's focus competition initiative that's going to be announced at the master's worlds. So that's a uh, really exciting, I would say, just kind of keep an eye out for that. Um, also the women's global event is in early August this year which is, uh, it also is um, the same day as the National Disc Golf Day. So we're trying to plan some things to support the Women's Global Initiative um, that kind of has legs of its own these days. You know, players are really excited for that. Um, my mom is one of these people that has played in it every year since it's, uh, you know, been running. And uh, I know she looks forward to it. So this move to an annual, you know, iteration of it is, uh, is going to be exciting. And then uh, we're we're coming up with some creative ideas for how to promote Women's Global and National Disc Golf Day at the same time. So uh, we're excited for that as well. Um, and then yeah, just kind of like the continued support of the majors here. We have we have all these majors back to back to back. It seems like uh, these next few weeks. So just uh, like I say, keep an eye out for PDG on the PDGA channels for any of that coverage and news. And uh, yeah, feel free to engage with us. We love hearing from everybody that that is uh, watching these events. So, um, and we listen to that stuff. So, please uh, let it uh, bring those uh, comments in. Awesome. Well, Danny, I really just want to say thank you for taking the time to come over and give us this update. We appreciate having you on the show, and we will definitely look forward to having you again in the future. Yeah, anytime. Thanks, Josh. Big thanks to Jamie Thomas for guest hosting with me this week on The Upshot, as well as to Danny Voss for checking in with us on the PDGA. It's always exciting to hear what's going on over at the Disc Golf Network and PDGA. I will be back with you tomorrow for our Wednesday interview series. Make sure to check that out. And then Charlie and I will both be back on Thursday for a preview for The Preserve. Thanks for listening to The Upshot. We'll see you later.